Ernesto Che Guevara's Spanish, was an Argentine Marxist revolutionary, physician, author, guerrilla leader, diplomat, and military theorist. A major figure of the Cuban Revolution, his stylized visage has become a ubiquitous countercultural symbol of rebellion and global insignia in popular culture. As a young medical student, Guevara traveled throughout South America and was radicalized by the poverty, hunger, and disease he witnessed. His burgeoning desire to help overturn what he saw as the capitalist exploitation of Latin America by the United States prompted his involvement in Guatemala's social reforms under President Jacobo Arbenz, whose eventual CIA-assisted overthrow at the behest of the United Fruit Company solidified Guevara's political ideology. Later in Mexico City, Guevara met Raúl and Fidel Castro, joined their 26th of July movement, and sailed to Cuba aboard the yacht Granma with the intention of overthrowing U.S. backed Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista. Guevara soon rose to prominence among the insurgents, was promoted to second in command, and played a pivotal role in the victorious two year guerrilla campaign that deposed the Batista regime. Following the Cuban Revolution, Guevara performed a number of key roles in the new government. These included reviewing the appeals and firing squads for those convicted as war criminals during the revolutionary tribunals, instituting agrarian land reform as Minister of Industries, helping spearhead a successful nationwide literacy campaign, serving as both National Bank President and Instructional Director for Cuba's Armed Forces, and traversing the globe as a diplomat on behalf of Cuban socialism. Such positions also allowed him to play a central role in training the militia forces who repelled the Bay of Pigs invasion, and bringing Soviet nuclear-armed ballistic missiles to Cuba, which preceded the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Additionally, Guevara was a prolific writer and diarist, composing a seminal manual on guerrilla warfare, along with a best-selling memoir about his youthful continental motorcycle journey. His experiences and studying of Marxism, Leninism led him to posit that the Third World's underdevelopment and dependence was an intrinsic result of imperialism, neocolonialism, and monopoly capitalism, with the only remedy being proletarian internationalism and world revolution. Guevara left Cuba in 1965 to foment revolution abroad, first unsuccessfully in Congo Kinshasa and later in Bolivia, where he was captured by CIA-assisted Bolivian forces and summarily executed. Guevara remains both a revered and reviled historical figure, polarized in the collective imagination in a multitude of biographies, memoirs, essays, documentaries, songs, and films. As a result of his perceived martyrdom, poetic invocations for class struggle, and desire to create the consciousness of a new man driven by moral rather than material incentives, Guevara has evolved into a quintessential icon of various leftist movements. His critics note that he killed political opponents. Time magazine named him one of the hundred most influential people of the 20th century, while an Alberto Corda photograph of him, titled Guerrillero Heroico, was cited by the Maryland Institute College of Art as the most famous photograph in the world. Ernesto Guevara was born to Ernesto Guevara Lynch and Celia de la Serna y Losa, on 14 June 1928, in Rosario, Argentina. He was the eldest of five children in a middle-class Argentine family of Spanish, including Basque and Cantabrian, descent, as well as Irish by means of his patrilineal ancestor Patrick Lynch. In accordance with the flexibility allowed in Spanish naming customs, his legal name, Ernesto Guevara, will sometimes appear with de la Serna and Slash or Lynch accompanying it. Referring to Che's restless nature, his father declared the first thing to note is that in my son's veins flowed the blood of the Irish rebels. Very early on in life, Ernst Tito, as he was then called, developed an affinity for the poor. Growing up in a family with leftist leanings, Guevara was introduced to a wide spectrum of political perspectives even as a boy. His father, a staunch supporter of Republicans from the Spanish Civil War, often hosted many veterans from the conflict in the Guevara home. Despite suffering crippling bouts of acute asthma that were to afflict him throughout his life, he excelled as an athlete, enjoying swimming, football, golf, and shooting, while also becoming an untiring cyclist. In 
he was an avid rugby union player, and played at fly half for Club Universitario de Buenos Aires. His rugby playing earned him the nickname Fuser a contraction of El Furibundu and his mother's surname, De La Serna for his aggressive style of play. Guevara learned chess from his father, and began participating in local tournaments by the age of 12. During adolescence and throughout his life he was passionate about poetry, especially that of Pablo Neruda, John Keats, Antonio Machado, Federico Garcia Lorca, Gabriela Mistral, Cesar Vallejo, and Walt Whitman. He could also recite Rudyard Kipling's If and Jose Hernandez Martin Fierro by heart. The Guevara home contained more than 3,000 books, which allowed Guevara to be an enthusiastic and eclectic reader, with interests including Karl Marx, William Faulkner, André Gide, Emilio Salgari, and Jules Verne. Additionally, he enjoyed the works of Jawaharlal Nehru, Franz Kafka, Albert Camus, Vladimir Lenin, and Jean-Paul Sartre, as well as Anatole France, Friedrich Engels, H. G. Wells and Robert Frost. As he grew older, he developed an interest in the Latin American writers Horatio Quiroga, Ciro Alegria, Jorge Icaza, Ruben Dario, and Miguel Asturias. Many of these authors' ideas he catalogued in his own handwritten notebooks of concepts, definitions, and philosophies of influential intellectuals. These included composing analytical sketches of Buddha and Aristotle, along with examining Bertrand Russell on love and patriotism, Jack London on society and Nietzsche on the idea of death. Sigmund Freud's ideas fascinated him as he quoted him on a variety of topics from dreams and libido to narcissism and the Oedipus complex. His favorite subjects in school included philosophy, mathematics, engineering, political science, sociology, history, and archaeology. Years later, a declassified CIA biographical and personality report dated 13 February 1958 made note of Guevara's wide range of academic interests and intellect, describing him as quite well read while adding that Che is fairly intellectual for a Latino. The first step in Castro's revolutionary plan was an assault on Cuba from Mexico via the Granma, an old, leaky cabin cruiser. They set out for Cuba on 25 November 1956. Attacked by Batista's military soon after landing, many of the 82 men were either killed in the attack or executed upon capture, only 22 found each other afterwards. During this initial bloody confrontation Guevara laid down his medical supplies and picked up a box of ammunition dropped by a fleeing comrade, proving to be a symbolic moment in Che's life. Only a small band of revolutionaries survived to regroup as a bedraggled fighting force deep in the Sierra Maestra Mountains, where they received support from the urban guerrilla network of Frank Pays, 26 July Movement, and local campesinos. With the group withdrawn to the Sierra, the world wondered whether Castro was alive or dead until early 1957 when the interview by Herbert Matthews appeared in the New York Times. The article presented a lasting, almost mythical image for Castro and the guerrillas. Guevara was not present for the interview, but in the coming months he began to realize the importance of the media in their struggle. Meanwhile, as supplies and morale diminished, and with an allergy to mosquito bites which resulted in agonizing walnut-sized cysts on his body, Guevara considered these the most painful days of the war. During Guevara's time living hidden among the poor subsistence farmers of the Sierra Maestra Mountains, he discovered that there were no schools, no electricity, minimal access to health care, and more than 40% of the adults were illiterate. As the war continued, Guevara became an integral part of the rebel army and convinced Castro with competence, diplomacy, and patience. Guevara set up factories to make grenades, built ovens to bake bread, and organized schools to teach illiterate campesinos to read and write. Moreover, Guevara established health clinics, workshops to teach military tactics, and a newspaper to disseminate information. The man whom time dubbed three years later Castro's brain at this point was promoted by Fidel Castro to commandante, commander, of a second army column. As second in command, Guevara was a harsh disciplinarian who sometimes shot defectors. Deserters were punished as traitors, and Guevara was known to send squads to track those seeking to go AWOL. As a result,
Guevara became feared for his brutality and ruthlessness. During the guerrilla campaign, Guevara was also responsible for the summary executions of a number of men accused of being informers, deserters, or spies. In his diaries, Guevara described the first such execution of Udemio Guerra, a peasant army guide who admitted treason when it was discovered he accepted the promise of 10,000 pesos for repeatedly giving away the rebels' position for attack by the Cuban Air Force. Such information also allowed Batista's army to burn the homes of peasants sympathetic to the revolution. Upon Guerra's request that they end his life quickly, Che stepped forward and shot him in the head, writing the situation was uncomfortable for the people and for Udemio so I ended the problem giving him a shot with a .32 pistol in the right side of the brain, with exit orifice in the right temporal lobe. Dot. His scientific notations and matter-of-fact description, suggested to one biographer a remarkable detachment to violence by that point in the war. Later, Guevara published a literary account of the incident, titled Death of a Traitor, where he transfigured Yodomio's betrayal and pre-execution request that the revolution take care of his children, into a revolutionary parable about redemption through sacrifice. Although he maintained a demanding and harsh disposition, Guevara also viewed his role of commander as one of a teacher, entertaining his men during breaks between engagements with readings from the likes of Robert Louis Stevenson, Cervantes, and Spanish lyric poets. Together with this role, and inspired by José Martí's principle of literacy without borders, Guevara further ensured that his rebel fighters made daily time to teach the uneducated campesinos with whom they lived and fought to read and write, in what Guevara termed the battle against ignorance. Tomás Alba, who fought under Guevara's command, later stated that Che was loved, in spite of being stern and demanding. We would, have, given our life for him. His commanding officer Fidel Castro described Guevara as intelligent, daring, and an exemplary leader who had great moral authority over his troops. Castro further remarked that Guevara took too many risks, even having a tendency toward foolhardiness. Guevara's teenage lieutenant, Joel Iglesias, recounts such actions in his diary, noting that Guevara's behavior in combat even brought admiration from the enemy. On one occasion Iglesias recounts the time he had been wounded in battle, stating Che ran out to me, defying the bullets, threw me over his shoulder, and got me out of there. The guards didn't dare fire at him, later they told me he made a great impression on them when they saw him run out with his pistol stuck in his belt, ignoring the danger, they didn't dare shoot. Guevara was instrumental in creating the clandestine radio station Radio Rebeld, Rebel Radio, in February 1958, which broadcast news to the Cuban people with statements by 26th July movement, and provided radio telephone communication between the growing number of rebel columns across the island. Guevara had apparently been inspired to create the station by observing the effectiveness of CIA supplied radio in Guatemala in ousting the government of Jacobo Arbenz Guzman. To quell the rebellion, Cuban government troops began executing rebel prisoners on the spot, and regularly rounded up, tortured, and shot civilians as a tactic of intimidation. By March 1958, the continued atrocities carried out by Batista's forces led the United States to stop selling arms to the Cuban government. Then in late July 1958, Guevara played a critical role in the Battle of Las Mercedes by using his column to halt a force of 1,500 men called up by Batista's General Cantillo in a plan to encircle and destroy Castro's forces. Years later, Major Larry Bachman of the United States Marine Corps analyzed and described Che's tactical appreciation of this battle as brilliant. During this time Guevara also became an expert at leading hit-and-run tactics against Batista's army, and then fading back into the countryside before the army could counterattack. As the war extended, Guevara led a new column of fighters dispatched westward for the final push towards Havana. Traveling by foot, Guevara embarked on a difficult seven-week march, only traveling at night to avoid ambush and often not eating for several days. In the closing days of December 1958, Guevara's task was to cut the island in half by taking Las Villas province. In a matter of days he executed a series of brilliant tactical victories that gave him control of all but the province's capital city of Santa Clara. 
Guevara then directed his suicide squad in the attack on Santa Clara, which became the final decisive military victory of the revolution. In the six weeks leading up to the battle there were times when his men were completely surrounded, outgunned, and overrun. Che's eventual victory despite being outnumbered 10 is to 1 remains in the view of some observers a remarkable tour de force in modern warfare. Radio Rebel broadcast the first reports that Guevara's column had taken Santa Clara on New Year's Eve 1958. This contradicted reports by the heavily controlled national news media, which had at one stage reported Guevara's death during the fighting. At 3 a.m. on 1st January 1959, upon learning that his generals were negotiating a separate peace with Guevara, Fulgencio Batista boarded a plane in Havana and fled for the Dominican Republic, along with an amassed fortune of more than 3 e hundred million US dollars through graft and payoffs. The following day on 2nd January, Guevara entered Havana to take final control of the capital. Fidel Castro took six more days to arrive, as he stopped to rally support in several large cities on his way to rolling victoriously into Havana on 8 January 1959. The final death toll from the two years of revolutionary fighting was 2,000 people. In mid-January 1959, Guevara went to live at a summer villa in Tarara to recover from a violent asthma attack. While there he started the Tarara Group, a group that debated and formed the new plans for Cuba's social, political, and economic development. In addition, Che began to write his book Guerrilla Warfare while resting at Tarara. In February, the revolutionary government proclaimed Guevara a Cuban citizen by birth in recognition of his role in the triumph. When Hilda Gatti arrived in Cuba in late January, Guevara told her that he was involved with another woman, and the two agreed on a divorce, which was finalized on 22 May. On 2 June 1959, he married Aleta March, a Cuban-born member of 26th July movement with whom he had been living since late 1958. Guevara returned to the seaside village of Tarara in June for his honeymoon with Almeida. In total, Guevara had five children from his two marriages. The first major political crisis arose over what to do with the captured Batista officials who had perpetrated the worst of the repression. During the rebellion against Batista's dictatorship, the general command of the rebel army, led by Fidel Castro, introduced into the territories under its control the 19th century penal law commonly known as the Ley de la Sierra, Law of the Sierra. This law included the death penalty for serious crimes, whether perpetrated by the Batista regime or by supporters of the revolution. In 1959 the revolutionary government extended its application to the whole of the republic and to those it considered war criminals, captured and tried after the revolution. According to the Cuban Ministry of Justice, this latter extension was supported by the majority of the population, and followed the same procedure as those in the Nuremberg trials held by the Allies after World War II. To implement a portion of this plan, Castro named Guevara commander of the La Cabana Fortress Prison, for a five-month tenure, 2nd January through 12 June 1959. Guevara was charged by the new government with purging the Batista army and consolidating victory by exacting revolutionary justice against those regarded as traitors, chivados, informants, or war criminals. As commander of La Cabana, Guevara reviewed the appeals of those convicted during the revolutionary tribunal process. The tribunals were conducted by two to three army officers, an assessor, and a respected local citizen. On some occasions the penalty delivered by the tribunal was death by firing squad. Raul Gomez Treto, senior legal advisor to the Cuban Ministry of Justice, has argued that the death penalty was justified in order to prevent citizens themselves from taking justice into their own hands as had happened 20 years earlier in the anti-Machado rebellion. Biographers note that in January 1959 the Cuban public was in a lynching mood, and point to a survey at the Times showing 90% public approval for the tribunal process. Moreover, a 22 January 1959, Universal News Reel broadcast in the United States and narrated by Ed Hurley he featured Fidel Castro asking an estimated 1 million Cubans whether they approved of the executions, and being met with a roaring S.I. Yes.
with as many as 20,000 Cubans estimated to have been killed at the hands of Batista's collaborators, and many of the accused war criminals sentenced to death accused of torture and physical atrocities, the newly empowered government carried out executions, punctuated by cries from the crowds of Alpirden. To the wall, which biographer Jorge Castaneda describes as without respect for due process. Although accounts vary, it is estimated that several hundred people were executed nationwide during this time, with Guevara's jurisdictional death total at La Cabana ranging from 55 to 105. Conflicting views exist of Guevara's attitude towards the executions at La Cabana. Some exiled opposition biographers report that he relished the rituals of the firing squad, and organized them with gusto, while others relate that Guevara pardoned as many prisoners as he could. All sides acknowledge that Guevara had become a hardened man who had no qualms about the death penalty or about summary and collective trials. If the only way to defend the revolution was to execute its enemies, he would not be swayed by humanitarian or political arguments. In a 5th February 1956, letter to Luis Paredes López in Buenos Aires Guevara states unequivocally, the executions by firing squads are not only a necessity for the people of Cuba, but also an imposition of the people. Along with ensuring revolutionary justice, the other key early platform of Guevara was establishing agrarian land reform. Almost immediately after the success of the revolution, on 27 January 1959, Guevara made one of his most significant speeches where he talked about the social ideas of the rebel army. During this speech he declared that the main concern of the new Cuban government was the social justice that land redistribution brings about. A few months later, 17 May 1959, the agrarian reform law, crafted by Guevara, went into effect, limiting the size of all farms to thousand acres. Any holdings over these limits were expropriated by the government and either redistributed to peasants in 67-acre parcels or held as state-run communes. The law also stipulated that foreigners could not own Cuban sugar plantations. On 12 June 1959, Castro sent Guevara out on a three-month tour of 14th mostly Bandung-packed countries, Morocco, Sudan, Egypt, Syria, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, Indonesia, Japan, Yugoslavia, Greece, and the cities of Singapore and Hong Kong. Sending Guevara away from Havana allowed Castro to appear to distance himself from Guevara and his Marxist sympathies, which troubled both the United States and some of the members of Castro's 26th July movement. While in Jakarta, Guevara visited Indonesian President Sukarno to discuss the recent revolution of 1945 in Indonesia and to establish trade relations between their two countries. The two men quickly bonded, as Sukarno was attracted to Guevara's energy and his relaxed informal approach, moreover they shared revolutionary leftist aspirations against Western imperialism. Guevara next spent 12 days in Japan, 15th to 27th July, participating in negotiations aimed at expanding Cuba's trade relations with that country. During the visit he refused to visit and lay a wreath at Japan's Tomb of the Unknown Soldier commemorating soldiers lost during World War II, remarking that the Japanese imperialists had killed millions of Asians. Instead, Guevara stated that he would visit Hiroshima, where the American military had detonated an atom bomb 14 years earlier. Despite his denunciation of Imperial Japan, Guevara considered President Truman a macabre clown for the bombings, and after visiting Hiroshima and its Peace Memorial Museum he sent back a postcard to Cuba stating, in order to fight better for peace, one must look at Hiroshima. Upon Guevara's return to Cuba in September 1959, it became evident that Castro now had more political power. The government had begun land seizures in accordance with the agrarian reform law, but was hedging on compensation offers to landowners, instead offering low-interest bonds, a step which put the United States on alert. At this point the affected wealthy cattlemen of Camagüey mounted a campaign against the land redistributions and enlisted the newly disaffected rebel leader Huber Matos, who along with the anti-communist wing of 26th July movement, joined them in denouncing communist encroachment.
During this time Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo was offering assistance to the anti-communist Legion of the Caribbean which was training in the Dominican Republic. This multinational force, composed mostly of Spaniards and Cubans, but also of Croatians, Germans, Greeks, and right-wing mercenaries, was plotting to topple Castro's new regime. Such threats were heightened when, on 4 March 1960, two massive explosions ripped through the French freighter La Cabra, which was carrying Belgian munitions from the port of Antwerp, and was docked in Havana Harbor. The blasts killed at least 76 people and injured several hundred, with Guevara personally providing first aid to some of the victims. Fidel Castro immediately accused the CIA of an act of terrorism and held a state funeral the following day for the victims of the blast. At the memorial service Alberto Corda took the famous photograph of Guevara, now known as Guerrillero Heroico. Perceived threats prompted Castro to eliminate more counter-revolutionaries and to utilize Guevara to drastically increase the speed of land reform. To implement this plan, a new government agency, the National Institute of Agrarian Reform I.N.R.A, was established by the Cuban government to administer the new agrarian reform law. INRA quickly became the most important governing body in the nation, with Guevara serving as its head in his capacity as Minister of Industries. Under Guevara's command, I.N.R.A established its own 100,000 person militia, used first to help the government seize control of the expropriated land and supervise its distribution, and later to set up cooperative farms. The land confiscated included 480,000 acres. 190,000 H.A., owned by United States corporations. Months later, in retaliation, U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower sharply reduced United States imports of Cuban sugar, Cuba's main cash crop, which led Guevara on 10 July 1960 to address over a hundred thousand workers in front of the presidential palace at a rally to denounce the economic aggression of the United States. Time magazine reporters who met with Guevara around this time described him as GUID, Cuba with icy calculation, vast competence, high intelligence, and a perceptive sense of humor. Along with land reform, Guevara stressed the need for national improvement in literacy. Before 1959 the official literacy rate for Cuba was between 60 to 75 percent, with educational access in rural areas and a lack of instructors the main determining factors. As a result, the Cuban government at Guevara's behest dubbed 1961 the Year of Education and mobilized over 100,000 volunteers into literacy brigades, who were then sent out into the countryside to construct schools, train new educators, and teach the predominantly illiterate Guajiros, peasants, to read and write. Unlike many of Guevara's later economic initiatives, this campaign was a remarkable success. By the completion of the Cuban literacy campaign, 700,000 adults had been taught to read and write, raising the national literacy rate to 96%. Accompanying literacy, Guevara was also concerned with establishing universal access to higher education. To accomplish this the new regime introduced affirmative action to the universities. While announcing this new commitment, Guevara told the gathered faculty and students at the University of Las Villas that the days when education was a privilege of the white middle class had ended. The university, he said, must paint itself black, mulatto, worker, and peasant. If it did not, he warned, the people were going to break down its doors and paint the university the colors they like. In September 1960, when Guevara was asked about Cuba's ideology at the first Latin American Congress, he replied, if I were asked whether our revolution is communist, I would define it as Marxist. Our revolution has discovered by its methods the paths that Marx pointed out consequently, when enacting and advocating Cuban policy, Guevara cited the political philosopher Karl Marx as his ideological inspiration. In defending his political stance, Guevara confidently remarked, there are truths so evident, so much a part of people's knowledge, that it is now useless to discuss them. One ought to be Marxist with the same naturalness with which one is Newtonian in physics, or Pastorian in biology according to Guevara, the practical revolutionaries of the Cuban Revolution had the goal of simply fulfill, ing, 
laws foreseen by Marx, the scientist using Marx's predictions and system of dialectical materialism, Guevara professed that the laws of Marxism are present in the events of the Cuban Revolution, independently of what its leaders profess or fully know of those laws from a theoretical point of view. At this stage, Guevara acquired the additional position of finance minister, as well as president of the National Bank. These appointments, combined with his existing position as Minister of Industries, placed Guevara at the zenith of his power, as the virtual czar of the Cuban economy. As a consequence of his position at the head of the central bank, it became Guevara's duty to sign the Cuban currency, which per custom bore his signature. Instead of using his full name, he signed the bill solely Che. It was through this symbolic act, which horrified many in the Cuban financial sector, that Guevara signaled his distaste for money and the class distinctions it brought about. Guevara's longtime friend Ricardo Rojo later remarked that the day he signed Che on the bills, he literally knocked the props from under the widespread belief that money was sacred. Guevara meeting with French existentialist philosophers Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir at his office in Havana, March 1960. Sartre later wrote that Che was the most complete human being of our time. In addition to Spanish, Guevara was fluent in French. In an effort to eliminate social inequalities, Guevara and Cuba's new leadership had moved to swiftly transform the political and economic base of the country through nationalizing factories, banks, and businesses, while attempting to ensure affordable housing, health care, and employment for all Cubans. In order for a genuine transformation of consciousness to take root, it was believed that such structural changes had to be accompanied by a conversion in people's social relations and values. Believing that the attitudes in Cuba towards race, women, individualism, and manual labor were the product of the island's outdated past, all individuals were urged to view each other as equals and take on the values of what Guevara termed El Hombre Nuevo, the new man. Guevara hoped his new man to be ultimately selfless and cooperative, obedient and hard-working, gender-blind, incorruptible, non-materialistic, and anti-imperialist. To accomplish this, Guevara emphasized the tenets of Marxism, Leninism, and wanted to use the state to emphasize qualities such as egalitarianism and self-sacrifice, at the same time as unity, equality, and freedom became the new maxims. Guevara's first desired economic goal of the new man, which coincided with his aversion for wealth condensation and economic inequality, was to see a nationwide elimination of material incentives in favor of moral ones. He negatively viewed capitalism as a contest among wolves where one can only win at the cost of others and thus desired to see the creation of a new man and woman. Guevara continually stressed that a socialist economy in itself is not worth the effort, sacrifice, and risks of war and destruction if it ends up encouraging greed and individual ambition at the expense of collective spirit. A primary goal of Guevara's thus became to reform individual consciousness and values to produce better workers and citizens. In his view, Cuba's new man would be able to overcome the egotism and selfishness that he loathed and discerned was uniquely characteristic of individuals in capitalist societies. To promote this concept of a new man, the government also created a series of party-dominated institutions and mechanisms on all levels of society, which included organizations such as labor groups, youth leagues, women's groups, community centers, and houses of culture to promote state-sponsored art, music, and literature. In congruence with this, all educational, mass media, and artistic community-based facilities were nationalized and utilized to instill the government's official socialist ideology. In describing this new method of development, Guevara stated, there is a great difference between free enterprise development and revolutionary development. In one of them, wealth is concentrated in the hands of a fortunate few, the friends of the government, the best wheeler dealers. In the other, wealth is the people's patrimony. A further integral part of fostering a sense of unity between the individual and the mass, Guevara believed, was volunteer work and will. To display this, Guevara led by example, working endlessly at his ministry job, in construction, and even cutting sugar cane on his day off, 
he was known for working 36 hours at a stretch, calling meetings after midnight, and eating on the run. Such behavior was emblematic of Guevara's new program of moral incentives, where each worker was now required to meet a quota and produce a certain quantity of goods. As a replacement for the pay increases abolished by Guevara, workers who exceeded their quota now only received a certificate of commendation, while workers who failed to meet their quotas were given a pay cut. Guevara unapologetically defended his personal philosophy towards motivation and work, stating, this is not a matter of how many pounds of meat one might be able to eat, or how many times a year someone can go to the beach, or how many ornaments from abroad one might be able to buy with his current salary. What really matters is that the individual feels more complete, with much more internal richness and much more responsibility. In the face of a loss of commercial connections with Western states, Guevara tried to replace them with closer commercial relationships with Eastern Bloc states, visiting a number of Marxist states and signing trade agreements with them. At the end of 1960 he visited Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union, North Korea, Hungary and East Germany and signed, for instance, a trade agreement in East Berlin on 17 December 1960. Such agreements helped Cuba's economy to a certain degree but also had the disadvantage of a growing economic dependency on the Eastern Bloc. It was also in East Germany where Guevara met Tamara Bunk, later known as Tanya, who was assigned as his interpreter, and who joined him years later, and was killed with him in Bolivia. Whatever the merits or demerits of Guevara's economic principles, his programs were unsuccessful, and accompanied a rapid drop in productivity and a rapid rise in absenteeism. In a meeting with French economist René Dumont, Guevara blamed the inadequacy of the agrarian reform law enacted by the Cuban government in 1959, which turned large plantations into farm cooperatives or split up land amongst peasants. In Guevara's opinion, this situation continued to promote a heightened sense of individual ownership in which workers could not see the positive social benefits of their labor, leading them to instead seek individual material gain as before. Decades later, Che's former deputy Ernesto Betancourt, the director of Radio Marti, an early ally turned Castro critic, accused Guevara of being ignorant of the most elementary economic principles. In reference to the collective failings of Guevara's vision, reporter I.F. Stone who interviewed Guevara twice during this time, remarked that he was Galahad not Robespierre, while opining that in a sense he was, like some early saint, taking refuge in the desert. Only there could the purity of the faith be safeguarded from the unregenerate revisionism of human nature. On April 17, 1961, 1,200 U.S. trained Cuban exiles invaded Cuba during the Bay of Pigs invasion. Guevara did not play a key role in the fighting, as one day before the invasion a warship carrying Marines faked an invasion off the west coast of Pina del Rio and drew forces commanded by Guevara to that region. However, Historians give him a share of credit for the victory as he was director of instruction for Cuba's armed forces at the time. Author Tad Sulk in his explanation of the Cuban victory, assigns Guevara partial credit, stating, the revolutionaries won because Che Guevara, as the head of the instruction department of the revolutionary armed forces in charge of the militia training program, had done so well in preparing 200,000 men and women for war. It was also during this deployment that he suffered a bullet grazing to the cheek when his pistol fell out of its holster and accidentally discharged. In August 1961, during an economic conference of the Organization of American States in Punta del Este, Uruguay, Che Guevara sent a note of gratitude to United States President John F. Kennedy through Richard N. Goodwin, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs. It read thanks for Playa Duran, Bay of Pigs. Before the invasion, the revolution was shaky. Now it's stronger than ever. In response to United States Treasury Secretary Douglas Dillon presenting the Alliance for Progress for ratification by the meeting, Guevara antagonistically attacked the United States' claim of being a democracy, stating that such a system was not compatible with financial oligarchy, discrimination against blacks, and outrages by the Ku Klux Klan. Guevara continued, 
speaking out against the persecution that in his view drove scientists like Oppenheimer from their posts, deprived the world for years of the marvelous voice of Paul Robeson, and sent the Rosenbergs to their deaths against the protests of a shocked world. Guevara ended his remarks by insinuating that the United States was not interested in real reforms, sardonically quipping that U.S. experts never talk about agrarian reform, they prefer a safe subject, like a better water supply. In short, they seem to prepare the revolution of the toilets. Nevertheless, Goodwin stated in his memo to President Kennedy following the meeting that Guevara viewed him as someone of the newer generation and that Guevara, whom Goodwin alleged sent a message to him the day after the meeting through one of the meeting's Argentine participants whom he described as Daretta, also viewed the conversation which the two had as quite profitable. Guevara, who was practically the architect of the Soviet, Cuban relationship, then played a key role in bringing to Cuba the Soviet nuclear-armed ballistic missiles that precipitated the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962 and brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. A few weeks after the crisis, during an interview with the British communist newspaper The Daily Worker, Guevara was still fuming over the perceived Soviet betrayal and told correspondent Sam Russell that, if the missiles had been under Cuban control, they would have fired them off. While expounding on the incident later, Guevara reiterated that the cause of socialist liberation against global imperialist aggression would ultimately have been worth the possibility of millions of atomic war victims. The missile crisis further convinced Guevara that the world's two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, used Cuba as a pawn in their own global strategies. Afterward, he denounced the Soviets almost as frequently as he denounced the Americans. Che was executed when he was in Bolivia for escaping the prison. After his execution, Guevara's body was lashed to the landing skids of a helicopter and flown to nearby Valle Grande, where photographs were taken of him lying on a concrete slab in the laundry room of the Nuestra Señora de Malta. Several witnesses were called to confirm his identity, key amongst them the British journalist Richard Gott, the only witness to have met Guevara when he was alive. Put on display, as hundreds of local residents filed past the body, Guevara's corpse was considered by many to represent a Christ-like visage, with some even surreptitiously clipping locks of his hair as divine relics. Such comparisons were further extended when English art critic John Berger, two weeks later upon seeing the post-mortem photographs, observed that they resembled two famous paintings, Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicolai's Tulp and Andrea Montaigne's Lamentation over the Dead Christ. There were also four correspondents present when Guevara's body arrived in Valle Grande, including Bjorn Kum of the Swedish Aftenbladet, who described the scene in a 11 November 1967, exclusive for the New Republic. A declassified memorandum dated 11 October 1967 to United States President Lyndon B. Johnson from his national security adviser Walt Whitman Rostow, called the decision to kill Guevara stupid but understandable from a Bolivian standpoint. After the execution, Rodriguez took several of Guevara's personal items, including a watch which he continued to wear many years later, often showing them to reporters during the ensuing years. Today, some of these belongings, including his flashlight, are on display at the CIA. After a military doctor dismembered his hands, Bolivian army officers transferred Guevara's body to an undisclosed location and refused to reveal whether his remains had been buried or cremated. The hands were sent to Buenos Aires for fingerprint identification. They were later sent to Cuba. On 15 October in Havana, Fidel Castro publicly acknowledged that Guevara was dead and proclaimed three days of public mourning throughout Cuba. On 18 October, Castro addressed a crowd of one million mourners in Havana's Plaza de la Revolución and spoke about Guevara's character as a revolutionary. Fidel Castro closed his impassioned eulogy thus, if we wish to express what we want the men of future generations to be, we must say, let them be like Che. If we wish to say how we want our children to be educated, we must say without hesitation, we want them to be educated in Che's spirit. If we want the model of a man, who does not belong to our times but to the future,
I say from the depths of my heart that such a model, without a single stain on his conduct, without a single stain on his action, is Che. Also removed when Guevara was captured were his 30,000 word, handwritten diary, a collection of his personal poetry, and a short story he had authored about a young communist guerrilla who learns to overcome his fears. His diary documented events of the guerrilla campaign in Bolivia, with the first entry on 7 November 1966, shortly after his arrival at the farm in Nankawazu, and the last dated 7 October 1967, the day before his capture. The diary tells how the guerrillas were forced to begin operations prematurely because of discovery by the Bolivian army, explains Guevara's decision to divide the column into two units that were subsequently unable to re-establish contact, and describes their overall unsuccessful venture. It also records the rift between Guevara and the Communist Party of Bolivia that resulted in Guevara having significantly fewer soldiers than originally expected, and shows that Guevara had a great deal of difficulty recruiting from the local populace, partly because the guerrilla group had learned Quechua, unaware that the local language was actually a Tupi, Guarani language. As the campaign drew to an unexpected close, Guevara became increasingly ill. He suffered from ever-worsening bouts of asthma, and most of his last offensives were carried out in an attempt to obtain medicine. The Bolivian diary was quickly and crudely translated by Ramparts magazine and circulated around the world. There are at least four additional diaries in existence those of Israel Reyes Zayas, alias Braulio, Harry Villegas Tamayo, Pombo, Eliseo Reyes Rodriguez, Rolando, and Daryl Alarcon Ramirez, Benino, each of which reveals additional aspects of the events. French intellectual Regis de Bray, who was captured in April 1967 while with Guevara in Bolivia, gave an interview from prison in August 1968, in which he enlarged on the circumstances of Guevara's capture. De Bray, who had lived with Guevara's band of guerrillas for a short time, said that in his view they were victims of the forest and thus eaten by the jungle. De Bray described a destitute situation where Guevara's men suffered malnutrition, lack of water, absence of shoes, and only possessed six blankets for 22 men. De Bray recounts that Guevara and the others had been suffering an illness which caused their hands and feet to swell into mounds of flesh to the point where you could not discern the fingers on their hands. De Bray described Guevara as optimistic about the future of Latin America despite the feudal situation, and remarked that Guevara was resigned to die in the knowledge that his death would be a sort of renaissance, noting that Guevara perceived death as a promise of rebirth and ritual of renewal. To a certain extent, this belief by Guevara of a metaphorical resurrection came true. While pictures of the dead Guevara were being circulated and the circumstances of his death were being debated, Che's legend began to spread. Demonstrations in protest against his assassination occurred throughout the world, and articles, tributes, and poems were written about his life and death. Rallies in support of Guevara were held from Mexico to Santiago, Algiers to Angola, and Cairo to Calcutta. The population of Budapest and Prague lit candles to honor Guevara's passing, and the picture of a smiling Che appeared in London and Paris. When a few months later riots broke out in Berlin, France, and Chicago, and the unrest spread to the American college campuses, young men and women wore Che Guevara t-shirts and carried his pictures during their protest marches. In the view of military historian Eric Duerschmied, in those heady months of 1968, Che Guevara was not dead. He was very much alive.